Yes, we can hear you and see you. Democracy dies in darkness. Beyond the threat of foreign interference, there are no flashy headlines for when the people realize that democracy no longer represents them. In countries like France and Israel, we see pensions that have been built on the backs of taxpayers who are majority young. In places like the US, we see social security come at the expense of the great existential threats of climate change and college debt. At the end of the day, we think the future is the franchise. We are extremely proud to propose. What is our stance? One, we believe that votes cast by youth should have more weightage in national elections. Two, this means that we will dilute the votes of people as they grow older. Note that the exact percentage of dilution is not important. The point is that we give youth far greater political representation in a system that already structurally disadvantages them. Clearly, this debate takes place only in the liberal democratic world where the franchise can actually affect political change. Three, in the status quo, there is already much hostility towards the youth and the millennial population. We argue that even if there might be backlash from the current elderly generation, the hostility predates this policy. Moreover, this backlash will only exist in the short term since when the current generation of youth eventually become the elderly, they will understand the purpose and reasoning behind this policy since they have previously benefited from it when they were younger. Finally, this policy does not mean the neglect of elderly or adult views. Clearly, these people can still vote. Additionally, youths now will be elderly in the future and they are best able to balance both the short and long-term issues in an objective and fair manner, as I will show you later in my second argument. Case divide. One, we protect the principles of the franchise. Two, we improve public policy. My second speaker will tell you how we ensure a competitive political culture. First argument on the principle. The premise of this argument is that state power can only be legitimized by the ballot box. Citizens use their vote in order to cast to represent their opinions, and the state uses this power to improve the lives of their citizens. This arrangement assumes that the distribution of power and of state policy is equal across all people. But this does not work in the status quo because the young are disproportionately affected by any government policy. Why is it that the youth are permanently underrepresented? This is because they are far more impacted. For one, they live a longer number of years. They face threats that elderly would never have to face, such as climate policy, which would have manifestations many decades down the road. Oftentimes, they are also implicated by funding choices. For instance, if the government chooses to spend on one issue, it means less money for settling other issues that may emerge in the long term. As a result, the youth are harmed. Crucially, these decisions are often permanent ones. They cannot be undone at any future election or any other point in time. If a politician is elected for five years, an interregnum on climate change might mean that it becomes unsolvable in the future. An increase in social security or pension funding necessarily means that the youth will have to bear the tax burden when they eventually become of working age. Thus, the youth are affected more by policy and should have the ability to effect it further. Clearly, they can already do this in the status quo by expressing their dissatisfaction. But the problem is that their voice is diluted and drowned up by more powerful voices among the elderly and the adult population. Thus, this policy is a necessary corrective to ensure their voices are heard. We already recognize the idea that we should accord um, the, the franchise based on how people are affected. For instance, states prioritize their own citizens' votes, although citizens of other foreign countries might be affected by trade and foreign policy as well. This is because we recognize that how far you are impacted by a policy determines how much say you should have over it. Even if they prove that policy affects the youth and the elderly symmetrically, there is a reparative obligation to give youth a higher number of votes. This is because we already accord political power based on reparative obligations. For instance, affirmative action policies or policies that protect the Native American population in the US. Since the youth were never present and never consented to policies made before they became of voting age, they should have the ability to change them once they are given the right 
to do so. Comparatively, adults were already there when those key decisions were made and thus have less of an obligation or an ability to affect it again. Therefore, the youth should be able to have a greater say in correcting these decisions. This means changing trade, economic policy that's been foisted upon them. In the status quo, the youth never consented to the military or prison industrial complex. They never consented to the debt that's been placed on them by previous generations. The least that we can do for these young people is give them the ability to change Point. their own oppression. On representation and re uh, reparation, we protect the franchise. I'll show you my second argument that we improve policy, but before I move on, I will take that POI. Would you devalue the vote of someone who is terminally ill and will pass away in the coming months? Um, yes, we will. We recognize that a person has less of an, uh, uh, will suffer less on climate change or on college debt compared to someone who is currently living. Secondly, we improve policy. The premise of this argument is that political parties have finite resources. Often, they have to face a trade-off. They have to invest their campaign funds to appeal to demographics that will show up to vote. Currently, most parties err on the side of the elderly. For one, the elderly are far richer. They have had more time in investments that have rose quicker than inflation. This means that they have the ability to donate that many young people do not because they do not yet have a stable disposable income. Secondly, for adults, they often have more time to campaign and to vote. This is because they already have a bank account and already have savings to support them. Meanwhile, the young often have, to work, um, often have to work paycheck to paycheck, and thus they are unable to devote this time to political activities. So for instance, even in countries where it's a national holiday on voting day, many young people still do not vote and are outnumbered by the adult population. This is a self-reinforcing cycle. The youth are not appealed to, and thus they feel cynical and apathetic about the political process, in turn deflating their turnout in the long term. Therefore, policy in the status quo favors the elderly. This is bad. This is because focusing on the elderly means short-term policy, overly favoring what elderly interests need, such as improving pension funds and improving the economy in the very short term. This immediately changes on our side of the house. When you have more votes, parties will change their calculus when they find an electorally determinant population in the young. This means longer-term policies, climate change, or settling long-term debt. Crucially, many young people also consider policy for the elderly. This is because aging is a linear process and many young people recognize they will become adults or old themselves and thus will accord due attention to such issues. Consider the fact, for instance, that Great Society and NHS reforms were implemented by the youngest generations of Europeans and Americans. This is evidence that in order to empower great social and political change, it's often children and the young who are able to spearhead that. This is not a contradiction with our other arguments because we have shown that the young are able to balance both these outcomes. For these reasons, the future is the franchise we are extremely proud to propose. Thank you for that speech. Uh, we are awaiting the opposition's answer whenever they're ready. Can everyone hear me okay? We can hear you and see you. Perfect. And just for clarification, I prefer my v uh, POIs to be visual, but if you see I'm not waving you down, then auditory will be fine. The right to vote is an intrinsic freedom given by the state for all people of all backgrounds, creeds, demographics, and ages to be represented within the democratic political sphere. But what is the difference between us and proposition? Side government wants you to believe that other voting groups don't matter as much as the youth, that they don't give up the same freedoms as them, that they haven't contributed to society, so they should simply have less of a say. We reject that notion entirely. Three things I'm gonna do in the speech. Firstly, I'm gonna go over our framework Secondly, I'm gonna to respond to propositions material. Then lastly, I'm gonna forward our first two substantive arguments. Firstly, on framework, we believe that in the status quo, specifically for voting in national elections, it is not swayed by either youth or adult votes, it is as representative as it can be. 
Therefore, we think that the burden of side proposition is to prove, firstly, that a disparity exists in the status quo in voting, not democracy in general, and secondly, why voting is the unique mechanism that we need to change in order to achieve that very equality, i.e., why can't things like limiting campaign financing or putting term limits cannot be done instead to achieve the very same impacts that they're talking about. Now onto what we heard from their side. The first argument was about the principle. They showed you that the state power is legitimized by the ballot box. However, the youth are disproportionately represented. In a similar manner, we will tell you that each person should be represented in society with the same exact vote. We think that the true obligation of the state is to account for the majority of the population. Governments are inherently majoritarian. They should represent what the majority of the population wants. Secondly, take them at their highest ground. Even if it is true that the youth will be impacted by future policy, we think that in a similar vein, the elderly also has an incentive to think about their future, their loved ones, their kids, the people that will grow up in the future world. They support things like progressive policy as well in the future. We think we can claim a lot of the impacts that they're talking about. They still have an incentive to care about progressive policy. The second argument that they forward to us is that, though, they improve policy on their side of the house. And I'd first like to note that they simply make this one-line assertion that, ah, elderly will hold more weight in politics without giving you unique analysis as to why that is the case. A couple of responses to this argument. Firstly, we will tell you that the nature of the political climate is shifting towards more liberal policy to begin with. Because as Generation Z continues aging, we're seeing more progressive policies being passed and things of that nature. This means that all their analysis that they're giving you about the, like the elderly population, not supporting things such as climate change and things of that nature, we can still have access to those policies on our side of the house. The youth are still getting politicians in power that can represent those very issues. We don't think it should come at the cost of devaluing someone else's vote. Secondly, we can test the idea that policies on our side of the house are simply focused on the elderly, cross-apply a lot of the analysis I've given you. If it is true on their side of the house that the youth garners more of a vote, that means you have less influence on the overall population as a whole. You're not being represented by the overall population. Remember, the elderly can still focus on issues that, that like impact the entirety of the population. With that, our first substantive argument is on the principle of equality. The thesis of this argument is that making the youth hold more weightage in national elections is a fundamental violation of both proportionality and representation. Two layers of analysis. Firstly is on proportionality. We think that the idea of proportionality is applicable to voting in elections. It is more than reasonable that each vote should count the same, especially in a national election. The state would be illegitimate to tell one age demographic that they matter more and have more of a say in shaping politics and overall governance. This is something that is given to you by the state when you meet the qualifications of participating in society writ large. Because all throughout society, people across different age groups and voting blocks give up the very same freedoms, if not more than the youth, i.e. paying taxes and giving up other freedoms in exchange for the right to pick their leaders. Thus, to give more of a say to the youth, as opposed to other age groups, violates the idea of proportionality, insofar as you're making one vote count more than another. And the reason why this idea of proportionality matters so much is because in the absence of adhering to the each vote counting the same, the state says that other groups who still give up the same freedoms and who still contribute to society simply don't matter as much. Second layer of analysis then is on representation. Proposition's world uniquely makes it to where the youth makes up a large proportion of the votes that are counted for. Note that this means that the youth can still shape an election even if they turn out less. That's to say that even in the countries where the youth does not turn out to vote as much, they still have the ability to put leaders into power that only, want the, or that only represent the issues that they want on the national level. The problem is, we think that it is the job of governments to support whatever the majority of the population wants to support, especially considering that governments are majoritarian in nature. This means that it is unjust to sway an entire country to whatever the youth demographic wants. Moreover, considering that the youth doesn't even make up a majority of the population, let alone they don't make up the majority of the votes that are cast in national elections, the state is illegitimate to enforce this. But take side government at their highest ground. Even if it is true that the youth tend to attract more progressive policies, we think that A, we can still get progressive policies on our side because that's the nature of the political climate is shifting towards that way. And B, it is not principally justified to artificially alter policy if that is not what the population support. Before I move on to our second argument, yeah, I'll take your point. Two thirds of the elderly vote, only one third of young people do. Is this A, proportional and B, representational? First of all, we will tell you that a lot of the reason, and I'm going to get into this more later in our second argument, that the younger population isn't turning out to vote is because they have a lot of res responsibilities to do and things of that nature. Even more than that, we don't think it's proportionate to have the youth vote, considering that they don't make up like the majority of the population, value more than the 
to the, like the other demographic, which does make up more of the population, right? Additionally, using all your analysis against you, we can still claim a lot of your impacts about improving policy and things of that nature. That is what the, like, the nature of the political climate is shifting to. Second argument is the value of adult society on politics. We've already proven to you in our first argument that adult voters principally deserve an equal vote due to their equal contribution to society, regardless of how they vote. But this argument serves to prove that adult voters are practically more experienced and thus cast better votes. I just want to characterize the difference between the two very de de voting demographics on, that this motion supports. The first one is the youth voting demographic. These are generally individuals who have finished, recently finished their education or they're still dependent on their parents, not financially stable, and overall have a, lack, a comparative lack of life experience. Secondly, contrast that to the older adult voting demographic. These individuals have more life experience, workplace experience, et cetera. The votes that they cast are resemblant of this. Proposition will try to characterize older adults as casting votes for longer term policy and issues that are primarily impact the younger generation. While it is true that sometimes older adults will be voting on things that primarily impact younger adults, we don't think that the elderly are inherently self-interested. That's to say, we think they're capable of voting for the good of the country. In fact, we think that because they're older and they realize that they might not be impacted by certain policies, we think they're going to be less self-serving in casting their votes and consider the best long-term impacts on society. In any democracy, leaders have an explicit obligation to each of their constituents because of the need of a voting base in order to be elected. However, in propositions world, politicians have little to no incentive to support those who aren't the youth because they no longer need their votes in order to win elections. Political platforms and more will, cost, will most often cater to youth populations because politicians no longer have an obligation to serve older adults and the elderly. Our first substantive argument already proved to you why this is principally unjust, but let's examine this practically as well. On average, younger voters aren't as worried as things like their health care plan, access to Medicare and Medicaid, retirement aid, and pensions and more. All issues which directly affect older adults and the elderly at a higher rate than they do, the youth are overlooking and unaddressing them. This means that governments aren't addressing the needs of millions. This can lead to the intensification of systemic issues, the degradation of social programs, welfare, and more. We think at that point, Proposition's world is uniquely regrettable, remarkably proud to oppose. Thank you for your speech. The second proposition speaker can speak whenever they're ready. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, yeah. yeah, we can hear you and see you. Alive as well. Thank you. I'm going to answer two questions in the speech. First, is this a legitimate policy? And second, how do we cater to the interests of different demographics? So first, is this a legitimate policy? The claim on the opposition side is that everyone should have the equal vote because everyone gives up the same freedoms to the state. My first speaker proved that this is not true. Younger people give up more freedoms to the state because they give up future freedoms too. If you are going to be affected by the devastating effects of climate change in the future, then those are the freedoms to a happy and dignified life that you are giving up with irreversible damages to you. So even the very premise of this argument, that people give up the same responsibilities and freedoms to the state, is just not true. And therefore, they have no principal claim to stand on. The other prong with this principle analysis is that the government must be majoritarian. Obviously, we recognize in status quo that this is not necessarily true, that minority interests matter too. But also, this argument is entirely hyperbolic. Our side is not saying that youths are the only ones who will be represented in the political climate. We are just saying that they will have more of a voice. And therefore, the net change is a swing in favor of youth interests, not a complete representation of them as opposed to anyone else. Don't let opposition get away with this hyperbolic language. What principles do claims we give you in contrast? Number one, we told you that our policy is an extension of the social contract because many irreversible decisions are being made now, which only the youth will bear the brunt of in the future and not the elderly. There was very little response to this, other than that the elderly can stand in for these interests too. I will respond to this later in my practical argumentation, but notice that surrogate voting is not a principle that we recognize in status quo. That is, even if I have the possibility of representing someone else's vote, it is not legitimate for the state to take away that person's vote and give it to me. No, thank you, because we recognize that people have a principal obligation to represent their own interests at the ballot box. They therefore don't respond to the fact that this is a legitimate extension of the social contract and what the youth deserve. Second principle of a reparative obligation to the youth. There was absolutely no response to this by the first speaker of the opposition. 
I therefore concede that a reparative obligation exists to youth because policies that affect them in the current status quo were made long before they were born. We see many parallels of this, wait, wait. where historical cases, no thank you, are justification for giving individuals more political power. For example, indigenous communities in the US get more political power over their own affairs because of historical disenfranchisement. This is exactly analogous, uh, analogous to the case of youth, over whom decisions were made without their consent or their foreknowledge. The implicit response we get to this from opposition is that the elderly have contributed more and therefore they, therefore they deserve votes. What we prove in this argument on a reparative obligation is that at least this argument weighs out because both sides have been harmed by this policy and therefore their argument does not stand. The final principle we gave you was on balancing youth under representation. They only give mitigation here to suggest why campaign finance laws and other measures can reduce the disparity that exists. Even if they can do this, they do not prove how they fully eliminate this disparity. We gave you structural analysis as to why youth will always vote less in national elections, not only because the elderly are always going to be richer, even if they restrict campaign financing, but also because the youth always have to work and therefore cannot always turn up on election day, for instance. The youth apathy that they generate is another cyclical reason why youth underrepresentation is a key part of the opposition vote. At the end of this contention, I prove that on principle grounds alone, this is a right that we ought to accord to the youth. But even if you don't buy our principled claim, then this debate resorts to utilitarian grounds. So let's talk about long-term policies and generally policies that will affect the youth more. The only line of analysis we get from this, from the opposition team, is that the elderly will vote for these policies too. Notice, first of all, that this is entirely asserted and they provide no analysis why. But secondly, we would say that even if a percentage of elderly consider the interests of the youth and a percentage of those people consider them more important than their immediate, long, uh, immediate survival, we would say that there's smaller than the number of youth who would vote for their own interests on our side. So at least on a comparative level, we get a greater representation of youth interests on the side of the proposition. Moreover, we think this is a justified trade-off for them to make because many elderly will consider the interests of the youth, but will also consider their immediate interests more and weigh them more. Second response we get to this from the opposition is that the political climate is shifting towards the left. No, thank you. This, again, is entirely asserted. Perhaps this is true in the United States, but across the world in many countries, there is a general shift towards the right. Look at cases like Poland, Hungary, even the UK, for instance. They have not proven why this is sufficient grounds to prove why long-term policies will be considered by their side. Even if there is a temporary shift to the left, which we might accept, no thank you. They need to guarantee a long-term representation of these interests because they are incredibly important. For that reason, even if the interests of the youth are the most important issue in this debate, our side structurally proves why the youth are able to cater to their own interests, and therefore their analysis does not stand. Finally, on the interests of the elderly, which was an implicit argument in this side. Before I get into this issue, I'll take a point of information. We don't judge democratic freedoms based on impact. We still have people in Colorado who vote on oil policy that will affect Texas. Why do we do that now for the young and the old? Well. Your side doesn't agree with that principle either, because your side is not willing to accord the democratic right of voting to foreign nationals, for instance. That is why this principle is not a coherent one from the opposition team. Now, maybe they will say, will you give this to other disenfranchised groups, for example, racial minorities as well? And our response is that we are perfectly willing to do so if they prove that they are analogous cases. So final issue on the interests of the elderly. Our side proves that youth have an interest to cater, a interest to cater to them too, because they themselves will be elderly in the future and therefore consider these interests. Even if they don't, we would argue that youth interests are more important because of the reparative obligation and other principal justifications I gave you in my first issue. Therefore, youths represent the interest of the whole gamut of society better, responding to their implicit claim that we ought to consider the whole of society when making these decisions. I'm now going to move on to our third argument on creating dynamism in the political scene. The problem in status quo is that the political views of the middle-aged and elderly are generally ossified and fixed because they've had a lifetime to make up their minds and there is a huge amount of cognitive dissonance involved if they change their minds. The outcome of this is that political parties focus more on appealing to existing voters rather than reaching across the partisan aisle to appeal to new voters. This creates party platforms that are increasingly polarized and divergent from one another, resulting in an uncompetitive political landscape where the focus, no thank you, is on getting people to turn out to vote rather than convincing voters to vote for you. This means that policy does not adapt to changing times because it is fixed in these polarized political echo chambers. The other outcome is that we get unrepresentative policy. For example, the privatization of infrastructure in the UK was generally not supported by a majority of voters, but because of these precise issues was carried through by the Tory government. 
Another reason for this is that older voters tend to think in terms of analogous historical parallels. This responds to their second argument on older voters having more experience. We would argue that the reverse is true, that older voters tend to resort to historical experience even when it is not relevant. Think, for example, about the number of unjustified American wars that have been compared to World War II or a comparison of US-China relations to the Cold War, even though these are clearly disanalogous cases given a shifting historical context. We would argue, therefore, that even if you accept the opposition's second argument, theirs is one of policy that is out of touch with reality because it no longer responds to current times and instead dwells in the realm of history. The comparative is, on our side, that youth's political views tend to be less fixed because they've had fewer life experiences, because they've had many challenges to their existing political views, for example, going through school and college, for instance. That means that parties on our side tend to appeal to more undecided centrist voters, which reduces the polarization and uncompetitivity of the political landscape in general. Regardless of your political preferences, a competitive political scene is a net win because it means that voters have a greater range of options to choose from and a greater range of options to represent their own interests. For these reasons, our side believed that the future is a franchise. We're incredibly proud to propose. Thank you for that speech. Now for the second opposition speaker, uh, Genevieve, whenever she's ready. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Awesome, thank you. One second. Okay. Democracy does not exist so we can sway the trajectory of politics. It exists as a balance between powers, an equal opportunity for everyone, regardless of any external factor, especially age, to put their best foot forward. Side proposition very clearly undercuts the most basic values of democracy, which is why we're incredibly proud to stand with opposition. So in my speech, I'll be doing a few things. First, going over the two main clash points within today's debate, and then moving into our third argu substantive argument. So let's start off on the first main clash point, right? Which is about the principal justification to this motion. What did proposition tell you in their principle? They told you that the youth should have the same representation as adults, and it's not very equal in the status quo. We have multiple responses to this, which have basically gone unanswered by side proposition. First of all, as Guy Person already explained to you, they did not provide justification as to why in elections and voting specifically, the elderly have more leverage. This is something, again, they didn't respond to in their two. The only thing that they tell you as, as like some sort of justification is that the elderly have more money. And listen, we'll agree with that. We even included that in our one. But then we're not actually talking about voting, are we? If the justification is about money, we're talking about campaign financing and there's no reason you can't do that with things like limiting campaign financing and get the exact same impacts that side proposition wants. And if their other justification is just that like, oh, well, two thirds of the elderly show up as compared to like one third of the youth, then again, they don't tell you why their impacts can't be reached by things like mandatory voting. The job of side proposition is to make sure that their side is unique and their solution is unique. They haven't brought that up. Do not be fooled. But second of all, they also say that the youth don't consent to permanent policy that is being passed by the elderly, right? Like for example, climate change. So using that same logic, under their side of the house, the elderly do not consent to having, for example, their social security and their pensions just being removed all of a sudden under their side of the house. It runs both ways, side proposition has to be consistent. But then third, note, if they're trying to gain access to impacts about things like more progressive policies, as I'll get into in the second clash point, because the young will have more sway, then implicitly they contradict this argument because now the young don't really have an equal amount of power, do they? They have a disproportionate amount of it. This means that the solution to the problem of quote, disproportionate influence, as they explained, of other individuals on their side of the house is literally just shifting that disproportionate influence onto another group of people. That is not the value of democracy. It's supposed to be about equality, not about unfairness. But then finally, we'd say 
that the elderly contribute a significant amount to the government, right? And they need to be repaid in some way. If we're not going to have it disproportionate, at the very least, we should have it equal. Their response is that, well, no, because like the youth have to deal with things like climate change later on, so they give up more freedoms. So the elderly had to deal with things like disasters when the youth weren't even here, things like wars. They've given up years and years of freedom that have extended far past the life of all, a lot of these uh, youthful individuals. So they have to deal with the chance additionally that things like their social security and pensions will just disappear on side propositions world. The consent goes both ways. Once again, side proposition had to be consistent and they simply weren't. Before I continue, I'll take your point. On issues such as social security and welfare spending, everyone can be affected equally in status quo given that the youth also survive on welfare checks. Why is it that the future concerns of the youth do not matter when judging this debate? Except you didn't talk about welfare, you talked about social security and things like, uh, like pensions. That's why, because it is specific to the age group of the elderly, they cannot consent to things like the youth just getting rid of their pensions and not having a retirement plan. But then what did we tell you under the principle, right? We say that there needs to be some sort of representation in, in, in democracy that is inherently equal. And as John already said in the POI, which they really didn't have a response to, that we don't award democratic liberties based on impact. We should award them based off what is principally correct. So even taking them at their very, very highest ground, right? And assuming that everything that they said is true. At its core, today's debate, since they want to set it, and we agree, in liberal democracies, it is, should be based on the values of democracy. Side proposition very clearly eliminates those values. But then we can move into the second clash point, which is about the practical benefits and progressive policy. They explain to you that progressive policy is supported on their side of the house through like these uh, younger individuals having more sway within the government. First of all, we tell you, as Guyberson explained, that the elderly will cater to the youth because they have family, they have a stake in the future, their loved one will most likely still be alive once they're gone. Note here that side proposition basically says this exact same thing, just flipped, right? They say that the youth have an incentive to carry the views of the elderly. They cannot say that it happens one way, but not the other. It's either everything or nothing, side proposition. But second of all, we'd also like to just say that the purpose of democracy, once again, is not to sway the entire like viewpoints of a nation and the policies that are passed into what you think is best. Even if we agree that progressive policies are better for a majority, like as everyone in this debate room would probably agree, it, if a certain country has a majority of conservative individuals, it is not justified for us to impose those progressive policies upon them and try and sway the vote. That is why it's not just, that is why democracy is based on equal representation and everyone having the exact, exact same say. But then in their third substantive, they talk about things like polarization and uncompetitiveness. And I'm gonna reintegrate that refutation into our third sub because it directly clashes. So let's get into that third substantive, which is about how this motion poisons the political atmosphere. This argument serves to prove why even if it is true that a disparity exists in the status quo between the youth vote and the adult vote, which they haven't proven yet, and if that proposition really wants to decrease the value of the adult vote to make it even, it will backfire massively. The first layer under this is about how it forces adults to turn to other avenues. It is true that adults have to significant, have significantly more money and capital than the youth do in the status quo. As we explained to you, it's usually because they're not dependent upon their parents, because they have much more stable jobs, they have more income, right? This means that comparatively, adults are much better suited to fund things like political campaigns because they can afford to donate to them. So what happens when you disenfranchise these adult voters through unfairly diminishing their vote? It means they will begin to turn to other avenues to show their political power. What do these other avenues look like? First, the most obvious one is campaign financing, right? Because adults have the economic and capital ne necessary in order to follow through with it, which is something that a majority of youth do not have. The second, though, is that it could also mean that they fund things like lobbyist groups to pass policy now that uh, instead of trying to elect the person that they like. This looks like an increase in things like dark money, lack of transparency, and much more political power for these adults in areas other than the election. If side proposition in their third substantive argument is so focused around having like a competitive political atmosphere, this is the literal opposite of that because you are directly handing these individuals more power in other avenues. But the second thing under this is about polarization. 
let's take proposition at their highest ground and assume that because the motion doesn't apply to like regional state and local elections, our impacts don't extend to all levels of the political atmosphere, right? In Prop's best case scenario, we see staunch youth supporters in national office and those who were elected by older citizens and the elderly and other governmental positions. This inherently pushes for a level of polarization in government, one that is significantly worse than anything they have told you in their third substantive from the status quo, because now state, regional, and local actors have to fight for basic representation in the political sphere. And that increased polarization is the exact same impact that side proposition has, except it is 10 times worse on their side of the house. Very proud to stand with opposition and uphold the basic freedoms and liberties of democracy. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Now for the last uh, proposition constructive speech. Hello, can everyone hear and see me? Yeah, we can hear and see you. Okay, thank you. Coming from Singapore, I won't say I know a whole lot about democracy, but what I do know is that I don't think op op opposition understands what exactly we stand for. Because I just want to make it very clear. This is not a debate about progressive policy, because we genuinely agree. Democracy is a good thing. What we are saying is about long-term policies. I think I'd like to decouple this. This is very, very important distinction in language. So I hope they don't talk about that anymore. That's it. Two questions. First, is this policy justified? Second, how will political benefits be distributed under our model? And why is that a good thing? First, is this policy justified? I want to point out, that the fundamental premise of the opposition case is flawed. Because if you listen very carefully, the premise of that case with regards to why we should have one person, one vote, is that the vote is given based on how much you contribute to society. That's why they use examples like tax. And that's why they use examples about how the elderly has given so much to society. And that's why we need to give them the vote. I want to point out, the premise that the vote is given to you based on how much you contribute is a flawed premise. This is simply not true. By this logic, we would not give, for instance, people who are unemployed votes because they don't contribute to society as much. Therefore, the fundamental premise of that case, that we ought to give people votes on the basis of how much they've contributed, is already flawed. The next premise we heard was the premise of majoritarianism. We told you in second speaker, this is not in entirely legitimate because majoritarianism is based on another principle. What was this principle? This principle was that we give you the right to vote based on how much influence the state has over you. We told you this in second speaker, and we didn't hear a response. Why is this analysis important? Because the claim we made was that youths are significantly more affected by the state than the elderly. Why is this the case? The first reason we gave you was that the youth often have to live with the consequences of policies in the future. We never heard a single response to this, so I suspect they conceived. The only response we did hear was that, well, you know, if in conservative societies, people vote for conservative policies, that's a good thing. This debate is not about conservatism, it's not about progressivism. It's about long-term effects of policies and who has to live with them. Let me make it absolutely clear. Even if this was not about climate change, if it was, for instance, no thank you, about economic policy, the youths often have to live with the effects of economic policy significantly longer than the elderly. The reason for that is because youths generally tend to live a lot longer than the elderly. That's just a simple fact. So the fact of the matter is that because the youth are hurt far more by the state, and the state has far more power over them, the youth deserve a right to vote. That's the first thing. The second reason we gave you, and the second principal reason we gave you, was about reparations. What did we tell you? We told you when the youth are born, or rather first, we told the youth don't have a choice to be born. This means they don't have a choice as to the kind of world they inherit. This often means that they inherit worlds that were shaped by their ancestors, something they had no control over. As a result, we ought to give them the more ability to be able to shape the way this world looks now, seeing as how they are affected by factors they could not control. The fact that you are born is entirely arbitrary. It is something you have no agency over. Opposition needs to tell us why it is legitimate that the youth should be given less power to shape the world in which they live at the point where they have no control over it. Why is this analysis important? Because even if we lose the practical grounds of the debate, we win on this alone. The reason was all the wings second opposition did for me when second opposition said that the principle is the most important ground of the debate. We agree. I have shown you comprehensively, first, why that principle is based on an illegitimate premise, 
Second, why the premise of our principle that you ought to be given rights on the basis of how much power the state has over you is a far more legitimate principle. And third, I actually think that youths are affected by the state significantly more. That's why we run on the principle we already win the debate. Before I move on to the second clash on how benefits are distributed within the political system, I'll take your point of information. So if the basis of our principle, which is on how much you contribute and whether you contribute to society is illegitimate, then why did your first and second speaker base your principle on why the youth should get more of a proportional vote in democracy based off because they have given up more freedom and contributed more? Well, madam, I think there's a distinction between how much you contribute and how much you sacrifice. These are two very different things. So the claim you made was that because the elderly have already made several contributions, so for instance, they have paid more tax, for instance, the example your first speaker wanted to use, that's why they get more rights to go. The case you are making is that the youth sacrifice significantly more when they have to live with the consequences of policies in the future. Because they have to live with the consequences of policies for a longer time than the elderly, this means they are affected by the state more and the state has more agency over them. Crucially, what we also told you was that many of these policies are irreversible, meaning that even in the future, if you want to try to overturn this, it's incredibly difficult to undo these effects. That's why we told you at the end of the day that youths deserve this principle right. It would be nice if you clashed with our actual case, not the case you wanted us to run. Second, on the distribution of political benefits. So, I want to make it clear what we stood for. Our claim was not about disproportionately benefiting youths. We did not say that elderly would die on our side. Rather, our claim was that currently, Youths are underrepresented in society and that this policy corrects for it. So we don't stand for a world where the elderly die, rather we stand for a world where, political, where the political power is no longer concentrated, it's equally distributed. So that's the difference, ladies and gentlemen. So why are the youths currently disadvantaged? We gave you three reasons. The first reason we gave you was that youths have significantly less money. Therefore, they have less money to be able to donate to political parties. As a result, political parties aren't going to pay as much attention to them. The only response we heard was that well, we have campaign finance laws. The first thing I want to point out is that this contradicts their second speaker's argument. Because if campaign finance laws are really that effective, then this entire problem of rich people being able to lobby wouldn't be an issue. That's a contradiction they need to resolve. So that's why their second speaker's argument is already contradicted. Second thing we told you, look, this is not a panacea to all solutions or all problems. Because the problem is that resource allocation still exists. So presumably, even if, uh, even if elderly people can donate less, Presumably, political parties still have an incentive to cater to them because they can still donate more than youths. So even if they cannot donate $1,000, they can maybe donate $900. At the end of the day, that's still more than a youth ever can. That's why our first reason stood. The second reason we told you was about the ossification of political views. We told you that often, parties already have established voter bases and elderly tend to fall into them. Therefore, political parties don't have an incentive to venture beyond this lest they risk losing their old voter base, which already exists. This reason hurt no response. That's why we win on it alone. That's why currently the youth aren't being listened to in status quo, because political parties have no incentive to move past their existing monopolies. Third thing we told you, youths are less likely to vote. They said, we can have compulsory voting. Obviously, if that's the case, youths might just, for instance, spoil their vote. The reason for that is because they feel disenchanted. They feel like the system doesn't listen to them because they live in a world where they've, because they've been born into a world that is structurally opposed to them. They live in a world of climate change. They live in a world where people don't listen to them. That's why even if you have your solution, it's not, it's not going to work. Why is this important? Because the only attack we heard in second opposition was that our policy is not unique. All of this has shown you why this can crucially only be restored by voting, by shifting political power back. I'm going to take them at their best case. Let's say it's true that one more elderly man does not have access to a bloated pension. We win the debate on this anyway. One, we told you that the youths are more likely to balance the present and the future because one day they will grow old and presumably they will care about having pensions. They said, elderly have children. Look, not all elderly have children, but all youths will grow old. Therefore, you, significantly have, you have significantly more people who are going to consider the fact that one day, like for instance, they will need pensions. That's why youths are more likely to consider this than the elderly. The reason this is important is because the harms to the elderly aren't as bad as they tell us. Even if pensions aren't as big, at the end of the day, it's still better than when political power is concentrated with the elderly. Second, we told you that long-term policies are more likely to pass because the elderly have less reason to think of this. They said elderly have children. The response I gave you still applies, which is why long-term policies are significantly more likely to like, pass. Third, we told you that you have more relevant policies. Our second speaker's substantive was about how the elderly often make decisions based on illegitimate experiences of the past that no longer apply. This argument had no response, meaning that they concede, rather, that on their side, the elderly are going to make decisions that are not verified, that are not legitimate, and not suited to the current unique political context of the world. For all these reasons, the franchise is the future. Very proud to propose.
Thank you for that speech. Uh, now it's time for the third speaker of the opposition to uh, bring us their last constructive speech. Um, can everyone hear me just to confirm? Okay. Yes, cool. we can hear you and see you. And I will take visual POIs. Side proposition loses this round in there too. They make a mistake that is so drastic that it undercuts their entire offense. Because when I ask a very, very simple POI as to why in this specific instance, we should assess how we award democratic liberties based on impact, they answer, well then why wouldn't you guys be giving all of these freedoms to foreign nationals? Recognize how ridiculous this sounds because that is quite literally their world. If we award freedoms to people based on how much they are going to be impacted something, then aren't you going to be giving freedoms to the people who are going to be impacted by illegal wars started by countries across the sea? Aren't you going to be awarding freedoms to people who are not directly affected by, or who are directly affected by a policy more, regardless of their location, regardless of how much they contribute, even though for literally two speeches of this round, you said you would award freedoms based on how much people contributed to society. Side propositions case is like a set of puzzle pieces that do not fit together and it's becoming very very clear at this point in the round that they've made a picture that will not function. Proud to oppose. In today's speech I'm going to be doing just two things. First, I want to clarify something very, very important before second, moving into two questions on first, which side best protects principled franchise, and second, which side best creates effective long-term policy in order to show you why opposition has won. First, let's clarify something major. We do not support things like campaign finance. Rather, down our bench, we have told you that it is their burden to prove that they cannot fix this problem with other solutions like term limits, like campaign finance, like mandatory voting. As we'll talk about more in the practical clash, which they apparently have misheard a little bit, the reality is that things like campaign finance run counter to all of the impacts they try and garner throughout this round. That was our advocacy down our bench. They simply try and misconstrue through it and hope for the best in their prop three. Now, on to the first question, on which side best protects fr principled franchise. On proposition, we give you two major lines. First, we told you about proportionality. Second, we told you about representation. Three main extensions that win us this clash outright. The first is that young people literally give up fewer freedoms. These are people who are often dependent on their parents in the first place. Recognize the fact that when parents are literally taking care of their children, they're literally filing taxes in the name of their children. They are the ones who are voting in the interests of their children and their future as well. They say, ah, well, not everyone has children, so we can't vote based off of this. No, not only do the majority of people have children, but the people who do not are still concerned about the future of the human race, about the future of the people around them and their children. It's not like people just do not care about community team Singapore. I'm sorry, and that was the reality that you had to engage with. But the second extension that we offer to you here is that democracy only functions when everyone has an equal opportunity to express their ideals. This is what Guyverson told you in first about majoritarianism. Why in the world would it make sense to have a young leader in charge of a district represented by 80% elderly individuals who rely on things like welfare if that individual is going to vote to cut them. That is the reality of side proposition where you award disproportionate freedoms to people regardless of what percentage of the population that they comprise. At that point, you in that district could have major policies that benefit their constituency like welfare actively undercut simply because there are a few young people that are now given very, very disproportionate influence on the electorate process. Third and final extension that wins us this clash. Elders give up quite literally more freedoms in the first place and they are saying that they in turn should be awarded less democratic liberties. Recognize the fact that if you go by the logic that we were going with for two speeches until they did a stance shift, then the reality is that since elderly individuals do things like more electoral participancy, more paying taxes, more things that give up freedoms in order to make a democracy function, then they should be given more influence on the electorate. That was their logic for six 
16 minutes. But then they did a big old turnaround in prop three and said, well, of course it's based off of impact. Now, the reality is that you have people who give up all of these freedoms, awarded less democratic autonomy, even though the policies impact them very, very similarly in a lot of cases. The few cases that they give on things like climate change, we think that everyone can recognize are going to be benefiting the human race writ large. So oftentimes they're still going to vote in that interest. Now, Opposition's only lines of offense that they have left to stand on here at the end of this question are just this idea about disproportionate impact. So let's quickly put that to bed. One, we don't judge literally anything else by impact because you still have people in Colorado, for example, voting on oil policy that disproportionately affects Texas. You didn't provide a unique principled reason as to why we need this asymmetry just here and why it only could be solved like this. Now, Second, we think that permanence also extends beyond generation. They're still gonna be worried about the permanence of things like climate change when it comes to their children. But third, there's quite a lot of variability. We don't know how long any of us are going to be here. We don't know if someone is going to end up terminally ill in the long run. We don't know if someone could be hit by a car tomorrow. We don't know if someone will live to be 105. Because we do not know how long someone will experience the impacts of policy, we can't now uniquely make the choice to make everything about age and about how long we can maybe predict it will be impacted. They didn't provide an answer to any of that uh, unclarity. They lose based off of that principled inconsistency. The last thing and the very, very last thing that they have to stand on now is this idea of reparative obligation. Note that even if you bought this logic, like literally everyone is going to have legislature made before they're born. Because they like really didn't like analyze this too much until they tried to spike it in the prop three, the reality is that they don't go beyond just saying that people in the long run like are born into a world with policies already made. That's not enough reason to just let them make policies when they're 18. That doesn't counteract any ideas about experience. And now when we talk about the practical, what we're going to recognize is this principle was flown all along because the reality is that it only functions if they really do create a better world for themselves. This practical clash is on which side best creates effective policy. Now on proposition, we essentially told you on existing policy, you take away things like Medicare that actively benefit people who are elderly and they even advocate for this trade-off in exchange for things like better climate policy. And the extension we offer to you here is that it results in things like increased polarization that Jen told you about in the op two. But second, when we also talk about things like future policy and preserving the support of people like the elderly who are still needed in order to create policy reform, they really just kind of throw them under the rug and say, well, we don't really need all of that. The extension we offer to you here is that you still need A, individual action from these individuals in order to make these policies function better, but B, you also are going to make the policies seem more radical on your side of the house if you have all of these elderly individuals no longer supporting it because their liberties are literally being taken away in order to put that forth. The only leg they have left to stand on here is that they vote in their own interests, so there are going to be better long-term policies when young people vote in the long term. What we told you is that even if if this is the case, what you recognize is that you are going to end this like short-term benefit and you still have people voting in the interest of future progeny, future generations on our side. We preserve those liberties, democratic autonomy, proud to oppose. Okay, thank you for that speech. Uh, now for your teammates reply speech, whenever they're ready. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you and see you. In the first two speeches, Proposition told you that the youth should get more of a vote because they contribute more to society. And then once they realized this was a losing strategy, the third speaker decided to shift their stance, saying, ah, votes shouldn't be based on, based on that, because if that was the case, the unemployed wouldn't get a vote. But note that was never the argument that we forwarded to you. What we told you was that everyone gives up the same exact freedoms, thus everyone should have the same exact vote. Proposition had a very large burden in this debate. They have to justify why giving more of a vote to one group that gives the same freedom. They have to justify why there wouldn't be more of a fracturing of the political climate when why policy wouldn't become worse. That is what we brought you down the bench. Two questions to summarize this round for oppositions. Firstly, is this justified? Secondly, what is the impact on policy? First question, is this justified? 
And note, the reason why this clash matters so much in this round is because if we can prove to you that the state is illegitimate in swaying votes towards one demographic, we think that automatically warrants a vote for opposition. The first thing that we told you under this argument was on the idea of proportionality, which is to say the state has to make sure that everyone's vote counts the same because they give up the same freedoms and things of that nature. Prop's best response to this argument was that younger people tend to give up more freedoms. What are the problems with this? Firstly, we tell you that younger people tend to give up less freedoms, right? John just told you, and third, that they're still dependent on their parents, that they still, ha that they still haven't contributed as much to society as the older demographic. Note, this isn't to say that they should have less of a vote. We still bang ourselves, we still, like, we still value equality on our side of the house, which is why the second thing that we told you in response is that democracy necessitates everyone having the same exact ability to vote. Remember, they have to justify why the youth have to have more of a vote. Even if they're on their side of the house, the youth turns out less. We still think that they had the ability to turn out in the first place. We still think they have a chance to be represented in politics. The second thing that we told you is that proposition violates representation to the point where the youth, firstly, doesn't make up the majority of the population, and secondly, governments are majoritarian. Proposition's best engagement with this argument was that, ah, but only one third of the youth turn out to vote. Look, the point is that they have the right to vote to begin with. They have the chance to vote. Even if it is true that maybe they don't turn out as much, maybe then you should, you should like encourage the state, you should encourage the government to have more policies to try and get them out to vote. Maybe things like absentee balloting, mailing balloting. They have to justify their mechanisms on their side of the house. They can just criticize why turnout is bad in places like the United States and things of that nature. But what was their comparable material? Proposition told you that the youth are disproportionately represented in political processes. We have a couple responses. Firstly, we tell you that the youth don't consent, like the youth don't consent to permanent policy. Well, look, the elderly don't consent to having their policies removed as well. The harms are symmetrical on their side of the house. Even if their third speaker says, ah, but sometimes the youth grow up, they will still want to support things like pensions in the future. In a similar vein, the elderly still want to see that their grandchildren and things of that nature, their children, still have like a society to grow up in, they're still gonna support things like progressive policies on their side of the house as well. We don't really see the uniqueness on that. Secondly, we think they contradict their own principle because their second speaker said, ah, we're shifting the, like, the voting power to the youth. No, that's not making it equal. They're violating their own idea of proportionality on their side of the house. That in of itself, we told you and we carry down the bench is unjust. Second question, what is the impact on policy? This is a relatively short class because I really don't think they did enough here. We told you firstly that the that the youth adult that the youth demographic is just less are individuals that have recently finished their education, they're still dependent. And that contrast, compare that to the older demographic, which tends to have more experience and things of that nature, they need the policies in order to support them. Another thing that we forwarded to you was that we poison the political atmosphere, firstly, because you forced it all to turn to other avenues, secondly, because of the idea of polarization. We don't think we got enough engagement with proposition on all of our analysis. We think it's far too late for them to shift their stance yet again and proposition reply remarkably proud to oppose. Okay, uh, thank you for that speech. And now for the last speech of the debate. Whenever you're ready. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Opposition's case was couched in the language of freedom and democracy, but they don't believe the principles that they stand for because they accuse us of a contradiction. They say, in your first two speeches, you said the right to vote should be based on what you contribute to society, and then in your third speech, you say it should be on, on the amount you sacrifice. That's not true. From our first speech, we said that what you contribute in terms of the rights you sacrifice to the state, not material goods, are the determining basis for the vote. The fact that opposition didn't hear this clearly is not a fact that we said. Therefore, there is a difference between what opposition accuses us of doing and what we actually did. We were clear that the right to vote comes from the freedoms that you sacrifice to the state. And opposition in their speech says that all people sacrifice equal freedoms to the state, which by the way also contradicts their later analysis that younger people sacrifice fewer freedoms. But we agree that all people sacrifice the same freedoms to the state. 
The problem is that the sacrifice made by young people is multiplied over the longer time scale in which they will be alive. And we have to consider that now because policy is irreversible. So actually, we agree with the opposition principle. It just applies across time and not just across space. For that reason, opposition actually agrees with our principle too. But even if you don't agree with this principle, there is a reparative obligation at play here. Their last ditch attempt to respond to this point was to say that, well, everyone has this reparative obligation and therefore it somehow washes out. We agree that everyone has this reparative obligation owed to them when they are born. That is why our policy extends to all youths and not just a particular subset of youths. The more important point is that the reparative obligation increases over time as legislation increases over time and more and more policies are inflicted on the future generation of youths. At the end of this debate, the only response opposition could muster to this point was that the elderly don't consent either and therefore there's an the obligation to them. The difference is that when policies are inflicted on the elderly, the elderly at least have some representation in politics. When policies were inflicted on the youth before they were born, they had absolutely zero representation in the political system. That is why they are justified in having greater representation now. Therefore, even if you buy opposition's analysis, it actually shows why our side has been more principally justified in this debate, not regarding the reparative obligation, which states routinely trample over the basic tenets of democracy in order to guarantee reparative obligations to historically marginalized groups. In spite of that, what did their world look like? The world of the opposition hung their entire case on the hope that the elderly would cater to the interests of the young as well, while simultaneously saying that the elderly vote in their own interests, which is good because they have more experience, they're wiser, and so on. Apart from the fact that this is a contradiction, this is also hopelessly naive, because not all elderly people have children, and not all elderly act in the interests of those children, because they are also have their own interests, which often contradict the interests of their children or their grandchildren. This means short-term policy in the world of the opposition that does not deal with existential issues that are crucially important to face. It means unrepresentative policy, where political decisions in the present are being made on disanalogous historical parallels that the elderly are carrying through into their voting patterns. What did the world of the proposition look like in contrast? We told you, in contrast to the fact that some elderly have children and that some elderly will vote on that basis, all youths will grow up other than the few who opposition says may die before they grow old. That means that there is a general incentive on the part of youths to think about the policies that will affect them when they are old. And that is why policy on our side is equally representative. If you buy the opposition claim that the right to vote of one person can stand in for the right of another, then you should agree with our side because you prove that that applies to the youth and the elderly as well. What this means is that our world was not like what opposition misrepresented it to be, where we give all the power to you. It was clearly an equal proportion in response to the historical, to the structural disadvantages that they face in status quo. Because opposition could not hang their hat on panaceic policies like campaign finance laws or mandatory voting, we prove that their side is not only principally defunct, but practically harmful. I'm incredibly proud to propose. Thank you for your speech and thanks both sides for the debate. You cannot shake hands, so please wave at Thank each you other. Good debate. Thank you. And we will now reach our decision, let's say 15 minutes at most.